Switching gears a little bit, because your your interests are not just are certainly not just the Nordic hamstring. That just happens to be kind of a <laughs> one piece of of your overall interest, which is injury risk, um, appraising injury risk, identifying injury risk. Can we do things about it? You've got an article, or your second author on a, on a paper called "Do Not Throw the Baby Out with the Bathwater." Screening can identify meaningful risk factors for sports injuries. Now, we recently did we do a journal club for with clinical athlete where we just like twice a month we we discuss certain topics and we go over papers. Our one of our most recent journal clubs was movement screening, and we actually used the functional movement screen and several reviews on on that as kind of the the crux of the talking points. And we used a paper by Roald Barr who is somebody who you've done work with and his uh, kind of infamous paper titled, and I don't want to get it wrong because it's one of my favorites. Oh, here we go. Um, Why screening tests to predict injury do not work and probably never will. And, <laughs> and right title. Yeah. So, and with your article, it was, do not throw the baby out with the bathwater was kind of a nice discussion point or a nice, nice rebuttal. Can you talk about your, your views? What does screening mean in the athletic population when we're talking about injury risk screening or movement screening or whatever you want to call it? What does that actually mean? And what are we hope to be looking for when we're doing a screen for our athletes? Yeah, that's, that's not a, a, a soup question right like that's a that that's going to be a long answer so but i'll try and do my best so just since we're admitting biases uh Ruald is a, was a co-supervisor of my phd so um and he's also the director of our injury and illness prevention program here at in doha at, at aspatar so um i wrote Ruald and i've had many conversations about this um so if we first talk about his paper, um, why screening tests won't predict injury and probably never will. Um, I think it was important because uh, it created a lot of discussion, but not only that, I think it really made us focus about what we are looking for in screening. So let's, let, there's probably a few things to unpack there. And, and maybe the first thing is to say, what do we mean by prediction? So um, as I understand it, that's trying to identify the guys who's going to get injured and you're going to do something to prevent them from getting injured, right? So you won't, you won't actually be able to prove that that's worked because you're not going to go to the coach at the end of the season and go, look at all these guys, they would have been injured, but because of what I've done, they, had, they weren't, right? So it's kind of hard to show the efficacy of that in a way. But if we look at prediction, if we look at the, if we, if we assert guys uh, or, or, or athletes uh, to high-risk groups, um, what we see is that, unfortunately, um, we are not able to find a really good differentiating point between, well, these guys all get injured and these guys don't. Whether we look at hip and groin strength, at hamstring strength, at quad strength, at the FMS, at least in the, in the studies we've done here in Qatar. So what does that mean? So if we, if we think about how, how um, injuries are distributed, what you'd really want is to have all the, let's say, weak guys at one end of the spectrum. And they all get injured. And you can actually draw a line and say, if your strength is above, whatever, 300 newtons on the, on the isokinetic test, then you don't get injured. We just don't see injuries in this group. So if I get everybody's strength on that side of the line, then easy, job done, we don't see any injuries. Now, unfortunately, that's just not what we see. We see guys that are relatively weak and actually relatively strong relative to the group, but also their absolute strength. Um, to get injured. So it doesn't seem like these tests that we use, number one, are a really good cutoff. And, and, and a part of, part of that is perhaps because these tests are really testing one component in isolation. So of course, injuries have multifactorial nature. They, they, they have many components to why someone would get injured. And, and now we're even thinking about organism health um, you know, your gut health, your, your general well-being as risk factors for getting a hamstring injury, let's say. So there's, there's way more to this than, than just whether you scored 300 on the, on the biodex, right, or on, on an isokinetic device. 
So I think that's important, first of all, to say that if we think about predicting an injury, like number 15, he's going to get an injury in October, that's impossible, right? And, and I mean, if we think about weather forecasting, so the weather forecast for tomorrow is actually pretty good. They, they're even getting as good as telling me it's going to rain at 8 o'clock now, which is mm-hmm. what they said for Dawa last night. So, but, uh, um, but a week out, it's really bad. And a month out, it's really bad. The accuracy drops to zero. You know, so Rod Whiteley, one of the senior uh, clinical researchers here at Aspetar, often says, um, I can predict the sex of an unborn baby uh, two months into the pregnancy with 50% accuracy. Right, so I, th- I think that's as good as uh, as it gets. Um, so there's some sort there's some sort of uncertainty uh, or certainty in that case, but uncertainty in our case that we have to just accept. Now, the reason Efert uh, for Hagen, who's a professor in Amsterdam, and Professor Ian Schreier from um, from Canada, w- w- the reason why we did that paper, um, why you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, is that. It seemed like people got caught up in, well, if screening isn't useful for prediction, then you know, let's just leave it. Uh, there's no use in it. And that's actually not what Ruwald's paper say at all. Right? At the end of his paper, he lists a number of reasons why screening is, is valuable. Uh, in the paper that Yefer did, we did, took that a little bit further and, and, and said that, well, you know, there are certain risk factors where we can really draw a line. Because if you've had a previous injury, that's a yes, no, that's a categorization, right? So, and the previously injured guys, they do tend to have higher risk. We're, we're not trying to predict your injury now. We're just ascertaining whether you have higher risk or not. And I think clinically, we do act differently for those players. If you've had an ACL injury, we, we, we tape your knee. If you had an ankle sprain or a couple of ankle sprains, we tape your ankles. So, uh, and not the whole team would have ACL taping. You know, like that's not something we'll do for everybody. We'll, we'll specifically target the ones that we perceive to be at higher risk. So I think sometimes screening can very valuably alter what we do clinically. And then the other thing is we can detect ongoing issues. So we've seen that here in Qatar. Arnhild Bakken, who's a researcher from Norway, she showed that almost 90% of our athletes after their screening had some sort of follow-up. That doesn't mean they always had action to that, but we had to have a deeper look at something, right? So arguably here it was a lot of vitamin D deficiency. But so here's the really interesting one. One in three, so about yeah, a third of the players had a musculoskeletal follow-up. So again, that means that we, we, we just had a little bit of a deeper look. We might have taken action or not. But so it seems that screening is definitely valuable for detecting ongoing uh, conditions or issues that we can potentially deal with. Screening also lets you get to know your players. So you, you tend to build a profile for players, right? So you build a relationship with players, which makes the rehab and the return to sport part down the line way easier. And it sets a baseline for our performance coaches uh, and for us. So if we're going to do some sort of intervention like the Nordic hamstring exercise and you have a baseline strength you can work from, that makes it really easy to see whether you've been effective or not. Now, I, I mean, so there's, there's different devices now. Uh, one that comes to mind is the Nordboard by Val Performance. That they're also a group from of Australia that, that really gives you nice feedback when you're using this device just in terms of the strength doing the Nordic hamstring exercise. But these kind of things will help us to make our screening process a little bit more valuable. And, and I think what really should happen, and I, you know, I think some of the clubs are already doing this, some of the, some of the teams is monitoring what ha- what's happening through the season. So moving from trying to identify risk factors to, to developing risk patterns over time. Because if players then move out of their zone of no injury or, or zone of, of uh, performance, you can say, hey, what's happening here? Usually this is quite constant and we've seen a drop or a hike or a spike or something. So this maybe gets back into the workload uh, monitoring as well. A little bit and I know you guys have done some work on that Um, and I think we need to develop more complex approaches to incorporate these different factors into a a complex pattern recognition um, type of movement and and I think the the answer to that the action to that might still be very simple clinical things so as Cherie Baker likes to say complex doesn't mean complicated right so you can have 
a complex thing, like raising a kid, that's complex, with simple actions of how to do that and complicated things like building a rocket ship that goes to the moon. And that requires physics and mathematics that's way beyond most people's uh, ability. So those are different. And I think sometimes complex things can have really simple solutions.